today, you know, uh, LEDs have many uses, and I'll, I'll touch a little bit on some of the uses for horticulture and some other things. But because of the timeliness, we've kind of uh, basically redirected a lot of our research towards the ultraviolet spectrum. And that's primarily brought on for the need to disinfect uh, food and water and some other things caused by COVID-19. So this work is done with a fairly uh, small group within our center of about eight researchers uh, being led by myself, James Speck and Suji Nakamura. So I'm to talk a little bit about just the, the general applications that we look at in the Institute for Energy Efficiency. Uh, and in particular, I wanna focus on some of the ones that are pertinent to this workshop today. That is ultraviolet light for water purification and also some of the visible LED work for horticulture that I could touch on later in the panel discussion. But for this talk, uh, just due to the timeliness and possibly you could even use some of this knowledge uh, to help disinfect some of your things like cell phones or food and, and water is uh, the advent of ultraviolet LEDs for the sterilization of viruses and in particular COVID-19. Uh, you can even use this technology to decontaminate uh, masks uh, and then talk about why that is, uh, why, why UV light works as opposed to uh, heating up your mask, which might destroy it. You only have a, really two choices to, uh, to help decontaminate your personal protective gear. And then I'll talk about our future research in improving the efficiency of the UV LEDs and shifting their wavelengths. And both of those will let us then apply this to broader spectrum things such as in, you know, disinfecting food and disinfecting uh, water. So here's a, a kind of a, a picture. Let me see if I can minimize this. Uh, there we go. Uh, picture of some of the, uh, the emerging UV invisible applications. Some of them you may or may not be aware of, but in particular, um, you can buy already these type of water bottles that have an ultraviolet LED in the cap here. And that actually, uh, that actually helps uh, disinfect the water in about 30 seconds. So I actually have one of these here and it's on right now. And one thing is uh, this is very safe because you can't see the UV LED, but the minute you try to take the cap off, the UV light goes out. It goes on for about a second and it goes off. But this in about 30 seconds will kill any uh, COVID or any other virus for that matter that's in the water. So these are, are quite popular. Uh, you're seeing UV applications now in surgical rooms. Uh, however, you'll notice there's no doctors present because you can't, this kind of ultraviolet light that we use, which is called UVC, is uh, hazardous to the skin. So you can't have any of this light on while people are present. But I'll talk about a solution to that that we're working on in the future. Uh, you know, people are scared to go in the swimming pool again for good reason. <laughs> uh, you know, chlorine does kill most of the uh, the COVID, but uh, as general precaution, some of the bigger pools add UV uh, lamps, which are mercury based, not LED based, to help purify the water. Uh, there's been a huge uptick in purifiers, by the way, and as you know, we're all working remotely. But as you can see, I'm in my office today. Uh, because I'm doing essential research, but I also have the windows open and I don't have any ventilation coming in because air has been, uh, transmission of, of COVID has been found to be the predominant factor. Uh, and so you can find UV air purifiers now that have added ultraviolet light to the disinfection. Uh, most of these are all sold out though, unfortunately. Uh, this just shows one here that was, uh, that's good for your room. But if, if we can get UV into the air handling equipment quicker, that will help get people back into the offices uh, faster because that can reduce the uh, uh, the COVID active virus in the air. Things like washing machine, LG is building a washing machine now in which they couldn't put mercury lamps in because you don't want to contaminate with, with the uh, mercury lamps. However, UV LEDs have no toxic material, so they're now putting UV LEDs directly in your dishwasher. Uh, and even, here's a coffee maker. And here we go. Here's the next one. So uh, this just shows you another application that I, I was initially going to give this talk more around the horticulture aspect of LEDs and uh, their impact on uh, growing plants in, in, in these vertical farming. Uh, this is already starting to happen uh, fairly small scale. Uh, and it's still, I would say, this is a, actually a plant factory of pitcher in, in uh, China, but even uh, grocers like Whole Foods are starting to use this. And this is a Normouth growth opportunity. And in this case, you only need a little bit of UV light. UV light was found to give the flavors in some of the microgreens. But the main aspect is you use a lot of blue and red LEDs. And the main thing is this grows 24 hours a day. So the plant growth rate is faster. 
Uh, but more importantly, uh, when you're growing these vertical farms, the water usage is about one to 5% of that of standard farms because the water just doesn't go into the soil, but you recycle it, recirculate it, that is. So that may be something I'll touch on more on the, in the panel session, but we, we are doing research in that as well. And uh, even looking at future aspects where we actually do a fiber-based delivery of the light. And in that case, we replace the LED with a laser light source. This one shows you a, uh, where we do a blue laser into a fiber. And uh, it turns out to grow plants, you pr pretty much only need red and blue light and a little bit of ultraviolet light. And so this was a demonstration we did here in collaboration with uh, Susan Mazur in the uh, biology department. Uh, so I expect we'll start to see that sometime uh, in the distant future, but just showing you some of the applications of light. But really for this talk, I just wanted to touch more on the ultraviolet, uh, what's called the UVC spectrum uh, LED effort, because this is, uh, I think, pertinent to, to all of us today, but uh, also can be done efficiently and safely. So uh, this shows you here, we're disinfecting some uh, viruses. I actually bought a, a UV phone disinfector here. I'm not sure you can see this, let me unplug it. But this one does a phone in about 30 seconds. Uh, and it's, I got my phone in here so that you won't hear it, but just showing you that this is starting to, and these are products that only have hit the market in the last few months. And why is it that these materials uh, that I work on, gallium nitride, are being used for ultraviolet and, and visible light? Well, what's shown here is what's, you know, for the non-semiconductor um, scientists in the room, the main thing you need to look at here is the colors here. These are the colors we can generate with this material system, which is called aluminum gallium nitride. And this is currently the only material system that you can use to generate ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet, or what's called UVC light, is wavelength shorter than 280 nanometers shown here. And that's uh, this blue line here. And you can see that only things about this blue line, so that is an, an alloy of, on this line here of aluminum gallium nitride will have a wavelength short enough. However, this material system is also the one that's used to make the white LED lamps that you can buy at Home Depot or the, uh, the red, green, and blue colors. Uh, I didn't go that way. Uh, basically, you can see as you move from the ultraviolet into the visible, we can hit it by just adding indium. So this is what, what a typical chip looks like. This is about 200 by 400 microns, and this is what we use to generate the ultraviolet light. So just a little backup about why UV light is very important for the uh, for basically disinfection is that it directly it's it's one of the few wavelengths uh, and you actually cannot get UV light from the sun. All the UVC light is filtered out by the uh, ozone layer, so we have to generate UV light basically synthetically on the Earth. And uh, when you do that, uh, you can see that it is the only wavelength of light that actually disrupts the uh, DNA and RNA in the uh, microorganism. So deep ultraviolet light will actually break the, uh, the proteins here. And uh, <clears throat> through these two, two pathways, either you basically uh, break the adjacent nucleic acids in the DNA or RNA, or you break apart the uh, protein. And th the good thing about this technology is there's to date never, there is no um, UV resistant pathogens that have currently been Found. So this is a, an advantage of UV sterilization in the era of drug resistant microorganisms. Uh, it's, it's basically one of the only techniques we have that you can use to, uh, we're fairly sure it will take maybe hundreds of years before there's a, uh, a UV resistant uh, microorganism. And so how long does this take to sterilize things? So we've, uh, one of our member companies here is Solviosis and uh, they, they make a little uh, handheld sterilizer but they did a study in which uh, <clears throat> they basically took a 1.3 milliwatt LED, and this shows you petri dish, um, basically with a, with a SARS-like uh, virus, which has been inact inactivated, showing you that after about 30 seconds here in these uh, blue petri dishes, you can pretty much, with what's called a UV dose of 40 millijoules per square centimeter, you can eliminate um, contamination by a COVID-like virus. So this UV dose is some complicated math here, but really it's pretty simple. If you go down to my little box here, it's if you have a, a basically a couple milliwatt LED and you know how many milliwatts you're hitting per square centimeter. In this case, uh, like in that little phone dish sterilization box, you can disinfect things like your cell phone or the surface of your uh, fruit 
in about 30 seconds with a typical kind of LED dosage we need. So it doesn't take forever to disinfect. So this is actually fairly fast when you consider uh, some things. However, as we'll see the case study on, on personal protective gear in which you've got to disinfect huge areas, you need much longer times. So how efficient, uh, what's called the efficacy is, is this uh, basically uh, is dependent on the spectral sensitivity of the, the virus This shows you wavelength here. And basically you want, uh, you want wavelengths that are shorter than 280. Uh, so things like, uh, this is the RNA absorption. So 280 works good. So this is where all the UV uh, lamps, the mercury lamps that you buy, they're currently. So you have maximum UV efficacy here. However, you can't have any direct skin exposure. There's a, a new class of research we're doing, which is called far UV research, which is centered around 222 nanometer. And the reason we're doing this, as you can see, it's about four to five times more efficient than our longer wavelength stuff, back up. Uh, but more importantly, there's been studies in Japan and at Columbia University that show it's, it's safe for the skin and it's actually safe for the eyes. Uh, and so they're trying to get FDA clearance for this. But in the meantime, we're having to help them uh, develop the correct wavelengths for this technology. And, and, and a lot of uh, other companies would like to see a, a high efficiency 222 nanometer LED. Uh, here's just a case study that I want to show you that was done uh, not by our group, but by the NIH, in which they uh, looked at uh, disinfecting an N95 mask. As you know, uh, I mean, I'm sure you all have a few of these at home and you're actually supposed to disinfect them or throw them out after one day. A lot of us are using them for many days. Uh, I can throw my UV mask in my little cell phone sterilizer. And the reason you can't basically disinfect these with alcohol or soap and water is because of the, uh, basically the uh, activated charcoal inside and they're composed of some things that will deteriorate pretty quick if you try to heat them up in an oven like cellulose and rubber. So these are the current list of CDC approved decontamination mechanisms. So right now there's only really three recommended. There's hydrogen peroxide, uh, but this is a hydrogen peroxide oven that you have to buy that hospitals have. You can use UV sterilization. So this is proven to be 99.9% .9 effective for MERS and SARS, or you can use uh, moist heat in, a, in an oven. Uh, you, you know, they also looked at uh, ethanol, ozone and steam uh, is another way, ethylene uh, oxide, but we'll see there's some, some problems with these techniques. Again, in this case, we uh, all the viruses, all the coronaviruses have these RNA in them and uh, basically RNA lacks a robust mechanism for sequence proofreading means it's, it's, it's actually much easier to uh, destroy this than DNA. So the, uh, this shows you the, basically the, uh, the, the, uh, the top four methods to decontaminate personal protective gear. Uh, current one probably in, in the highest dominance is vaporized hydrogen peroxide. So this is good because it, it does it in about 10 minutes and it's good for up to three uses. Uh, however, you can't buy this at home. This is currently fairly big ovens made by Panasonic and they're typically only available in, uh, in hospitals. Uh, UV sterilization is good for the same, at least up to three reuses. Uh, we now think it's good for up to six, possibly more. Uh, the only disadvantage here is, is because the UV LED powers are still low, uh, and the LEDs are positioned 50 centimeters away from the personal protective gear, it takes about an hour. And this shows you the, the virus um, kill rate here, showing you you have to go out to about 55 minutes because you want to get down to this dash line here. Uh, ethanol, you can see, is very fast. However, as we can see, ethanol uh, basically damages the mask after the first, tr first try. So that is, you cannot, unfortunately, disinfect your N95 masks with uh, with alcohol, with ethanol in this case. So it's not recommended anymore. Uh, and really uh, one method you could do is you can heat them up in the oven at 70 degrees C for an hour. That also works, but unfortunately that damages the uh, rubber in the material. So that only works for up to two times. So right now really the only, the hydrogen peroxide and the UV sterilization are being used in hospitals uh, to uh, recycle some of the personal protective gear. Uh, just talking about how uh, the company we, we work with, uh, you know, does some of the uh, UV efficacies evaluated. 
Uh, and we're working with the biology department here to um, hopefully uh, work with a professor there who will help us get uh, the ability to do this at UCSB. But basically, it's a fairly long process where you've got to uh, maintain a, uh, a basically inoculated form of the SARS-CoV mass deposited on the uh, on your, whatever you're trying to disinfect. And in the study at this uh, NIH, you can see that their power density was basically a thousand times lower than what the uh, Seoul Semiconductor study was of, and this is why it took an hour instead of 30 seconds. So they basically pulled back the LEDs to 50 uh, centimeters. And so uh, basically af after several days, you could see where you're growing the virus and where it's not growing. And the interesting thing is their study came up to pretty much the same uh, millijoules per square centimeter that the Seoul Semiconductor Study, which was done at the Korean uh, University of Health and Sciences, which is that they needed 38 millijoules per square centimeter. So these kind of uh, power levels of getting up to 40 milliwatts would mean that you could disinfect eventually in a second. And so that means we just need to improve the efficiency and power of our LEDs at the right spectral width, and this could be a much faster mechanism. And it just shows you uh, from the, uh, from this was for the earlier SARS virus, basically how the, you can just see here in a, in a small Petri dish, what's called the cytopathic effect, uh, basically for the various doses of UV that you can get down into these fairly safely. So like, I guess the last part of my talk, I just wanna show you the status of our current project and show you the power levels we're getting are now to the level that you can speed up the disinfection we use, um, we're basically in the materials electrical engineering department. So this is actually what a, a cross section of our chip looks like. So we have a, a large number of graduate students working on this material P aluminum gallium nitride and combining that with an aluminum gallium nitride. This gets you what's called a PN diode and uh, where you generate light at this uh, middle active region here. And in particular, we've developed technologies where we put high reflectivity mirrors on it and uh, over the last several, uh, actually over the last decade, we've optimized the right uh, roughness or light extraction technology with a KOH uh, backside etch so that all the light comes out one side of the chip uh, after we've removed the substrate. So these are so-called thin film flip chips and they give you very good efficiencies. And uh, as I've shown here, here's the wavelengths. So in the 280 nanometer range here with the stars here, the UCSB work, we're now able to get to up to the, uh, similar to the best efficiencies in the commercial devices. There's one result up here at 20% for a, uh, an experimental uh, device. However, this was at a power level that was so low that it's not uh, commercially usable yet. Uh, it was done some work done in Japan. So for the most part, uh, it basically our effort is on par with where the commercial world is. And it just shows you what's called fairly narrow, beautiful spectrums coming out of the LED. Uh, the more important thing that we've contributed to uh, with our member companies is increasing the power you can get from, from our LEDs. So uh, I showed you earlier, Sol was using one to two milliwatt chips. This shows you that we can now, from a standard size chip, get 7.6 milliwatts, which you could take as either reducing the time to disinfect by a factor of six, or you could uh, increase the area. And so this was obtained after we roughened the chip, uh, shown here in red. Uh, whereas we, when we didn't roughen the chip, we only got four milliwatts out. So one of the companies we work with in our center, Solviosis, is making commercial products. They're also employing some roughness technique uh, that they've licensed from us. So this is, this is then the impact of getting to the power levels you need now to disinfect things uh, like water and, and do it in a much faster means. Uh, shown here, we've tried it to go shorter in wavelength. Uh, this shows you as we go shorter in, in the wavelength, the efficiency drops from about 4%, so we're now around 2% efficiency. So we have to improve this efficiency a lot, and this is our roadmap here to improve that. Why does efficiency matter? Well, this is, it's very similar to solar cell efficiency. The more efficient you make your LED or solar cell, the more energy you produce or save. And so right now we're in a 2-4% range, but the LED light bulb you buy in the store is about 50% efficient. So we have about a factor of 25 improvement we can do uh, by employing uh, further research in this area. So right now, this shows you the red curves are where we're actually at. We're in the two to 4% range. And after we employ LEDs with tunnel junctions, 
we'll be able to get up into the 20% range, we think in just a, a few short years, eventually targeting 50%. And what that will let you do is basically, hopefully one day, just put all your food in a box when you bring it home, turn on the UV light, and within a few seconds, you can take the food out rather than spraying it with alcohol, which hopefully you're all doing right now. Another thing, if we shorten the wavelength into the 230 nanometer regime, you can imagine that you could actually start to use this directly in the surgical rooms without the uh, without doctors having to leave the room. Currently, uh, they have to leave the uh, surgical table, but at wavelengths uh, below 230, this will allow humans to be present during the disinfection process. Uh, so this is some of the current work uh, and progress we've done. Uh, just showing you how really detailed the science is in here, but basically these acronyms stand for dislocation densities. And some of our improvements have been in reducing the dislocation densities. Uh, they used to be a billion per square centimeter. We're now around 10 to the eight. We've also reduced the voltage uh, quite a bit. Actually, we're now around five volts. Uh, so as we lower the voltage, the wall plug efficiency goes up. Extraction efficiency has improved a lot. Uh, and so as we employ some of these techniques, we'll be able to make uh, hopefully one day, very efficient UV disinfection and other tools. So this is this shows the, the total uh, group working on LED uh, research and uh, currently the far UVC uh, work because we had to pretty much jumpstart this work just six months ago has been started with a crowdfunding site uh, and uh, shortening the wavelength, as I mentioned, will let us basically expand the UV LED to work to all the places in public spaces that you need it which would be uh, air handling. Um, you can even imagine having UVC on the, uh, on the airplane. Uh, cruise ships, I'm sure would love to have UVC light. That's safer than existing uh, UVC. Currently, the only disinfection method they do is just a, a HEPA filter. But uh, if you add UVC to the filtration system, then you'll give you another level of uh, security um, that none of the virus is gonna get recirculated through. Uh, Currently, the only sources for this far UVC uh, are, are lamps, eczema lamps are very expensive and fragile, but similar to LED technology dropping in cost for the lighting aspect, we hope that our research will enable that one day for you to go to the store and buy air handling equipment or purifiers with very cheap and very efficient uh, UV air handling and water purification. So with that, I'll take questions and uh, thank you for your attention. So we have a few questions from our audience already. Uh, one question is, can UV handle or kill other things like salmonella, listeria, E. coli, all uh, problems in food processing? Uh, yes, it can. It, it, uh, it's been shown, uh, and there's several studies on this, bacteria are just uh, also not UV uh, resistant and uh, viruses. So it, I have seen it used in uh, disinfecting cooking surfaces. So they made a UV lamp that at night when the chefs leave, they just turn on the UV. And in the biology department here, they disinfect their fume, their hood at night. They just turn on the UV lamp for like 30 minutes. You know, it's actually surprising to me that it really hasn't like gone into meat packing and some of these other food processing things. Uh, like you mentioned, salmonella. I know cantaloupe farms have a big problem with that. Uh, but, you know, like I said, we've got to be able to make it cheaper and widespread up to the COVID epidemic. The UV LED market was extremely small, less than 50 million, but I think it's going to grow about, I heard it's going to be tenfold this year, and that's entirely limited by the, the lack of uh, production equipment and companies that, that are working on it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, looks like there's a, another question in the, uh, in the chat here. Um, oh, can UV A or B be used for disinfection with other mechanisms? Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, we'll talk about what is UV A and B. So these are the UV A's like 400 nanometers down to about 350 and UV B's like from 350 down to 280. So these are the kind of the longer wavelength UV. And it has been shown that these other uh, wavelengths can also be used and they're a little less, you know, they don't give you as bad a sunburn as UVC, uh, but you need other materials like, it turns out you need titanium dioxide to be used in combination with the UVA. And the way that works is it's a photocatalytic effect. That is the, the violet light hits the titanium dioxide and generates electrons on the surface, which then kill the bacteria. 
Uh, most importantly, those are mainly those other wavelengths are good for bacteria, but they haven't been shown to kill the viruses. Bacteria is actually easier to kill than the virus. And uh, uh, so that also works. Also, there's, a, there's just enough UVB, uh, and I didn't show it, but in that spectral range, there was some, some killing going on of the DNA with the UVB. It just it takes uh, seven hours. So the CDC recommendation for if you want to put your mask in the sun, it's about seven hours. Of, so it takes a long time, but it, it will work. Uh, so I shouldn't say that all UVB is, is not, won't work. It just takes, you know, instead of 30 seconds, it takes seven hours in the sun. And what you're doing is you're giving the virus a bad sunburn. So if it's not sunny, you're out of luck. Bob, did you have a question? Yeah, Steve, I, this is fascinating. Um, I've been wondering since air uh, transmission through the air is a big issue and buildings and building air systems or cruise ships are, are obviously a big problem. Can you stick the UVC in the plenums or in the ductwork where nobody can see it, but it could be consistently knocking stuff out in the air systems? Is that being done? Yeah, that, that study is being done as we speak. Uh, the company we work with, along with another company in the US, are working with uh, air handlers right now. Uh, the, uh, so the, it will work, and they've shown that it, it's very effective, expect, when, especially when combined with a filter, because the filter slows it enough. What's hard is if you, if you don't have the filter and you're just, just trying to kill it moving through the air, you need right. powers. You need like watts of power. But as long as you can slow down the virus and hit, have it stop on a surface of a, a HEPA filter, they were shown that they're able to kill it on the HEPA filter. So, and like I said, it's just getting these air handling companies to start implementing it. Uh, you know, cruise ships don't want to use mercury. Submarines don't want to use mercury lamps. So that means they have to use LED. And the only problem is actually a cost problem. What I didn't tell you, it, it, it's quite costly. Like that little mobile phone disinfection thing I bought was $50 or that water bottle. And that's because the UV LED cost is very high now. It's about $6 in LED. And that's just due to low volumes. For your light bulb, you know, it's a dollar now for an LED lamp. So we, we've got to make the powers and costs come down. And when you do that, then air handling will be uh, exactly like you said. You just put it in a plenum. And you can put the longer wave, like you don't have to go to the far UVC, you could, you could uh, use it now. In fact, in my office at UCSB, I do have a, an air handler here with a UV in it. Uh-huh. Okay. It unfortunately, it is sold out. Otherwise, I'd be telling uh, Henry Yang to buy all the professor's one. But, you know, there are a couple online you can buy. And uh, if, if anybody's not working at home or anybody's working in office, especially if there's other people around, you might consider buying a uh, purifier with a HEPA filter and UV in it because it, it is more efficacy. Thank you. John, did you have a question? Yeah, Steve, obviously I'd like to use a laser in terms of getting higher intensity and, and how what's the shortest wavelength laser you've been able to make and what's the prospects for making a UVC laser? Yeah, the, the prospects are, are good long-term, but the shortest wavelength demonstrated to date for this material system is 364. So that's UVA. So we have a long way to go to get to UVC to get to 200. However, uh, what's called a photo pumped laser, that is, you know, when somebody pumps it with a, a, a neodymium YAG has been shown to be uh, 250. So in the right wavelength range. So we know the material is capable of it, but nobody's made a UVB uh, or a UVC laser yet. And as you know, once we do that, yeah, the power levels then can be in the watt range and, and that would change it. But then we gotta be really careful about safety because now you got a, a lot of UV power and it's coherent. So we'd probably have that in the plenum uh, as well, like Robert had mentioned, make sure we keep it. But so I think, I think it, we're about four years away from getting a UVC laser. We could do it. It's just going to take time. 